Das. Hare Krishna. Jai Srila Prabhupada. So today it's um what's the day today, Rewan? Twenty-five? Twenty-four, twenty-five. <laughs> Prabhupada said craziness. Today is Balaram's appearance day. And um we had advertised that we were gonna do a class on the demons within us. And at uh, that time I, I forgot somehow or other I was very busy and I forgot that it was Balaram's parents' day. So we're going to combine the topic of the demons within, battling the demons within, with the parents' day of Balaram, 25th. Yeah, my watch says it's the 24th. Let's correct that because of the um, the travel I do. Sometimes the watch is not happy about all the traveling I'm doing. So I want to read from the 7th Canto, 15th chapter. This is text 45, 7, 15, 45. And it is 1, 2, 3, 4th paragraph. Hare Krishna, Kamaniya, Kijai. And welcome to everyone, Leela Purushottam and Venerati and Kintardepa, Kurnista Patraka. Could that be Shama Sundari, Priya? Okay, and more are on their way. Thousands and millions are coming. To glorify Balaram. Significant in this verse are the words Gyanasim Achutta Bala. Gyanasim, the sword of knowledge, is given by Krishna. And when one serves the Guru and Krishna in order to hold the sword of knowledge of Krishna's instructions, Balaram gives one strength. So this example is sometimes given. You cut, uh, you you cut material attachment with the sword of knowledge. It's given in the Bhagavatam. Chindanti, cut it. So here that example is given. The sword of knowledge. You cut the entanglement with the sword of knowledge, but you need strength to hold the sword. So Krishna gives the sword of knowledge through his instructions, and Balaram, as the Adi Guru, gives the strength to hold the sword, or gives the strength to execute the instruction. Just like we have spoken many times about this problem, that you know something, but you don't have the strength to follow it. So this example is, is very appropriate. We know something, knowing is not so much of a problem, at least not for us as devotees, because we have vast amounts of knowledge. But having the strength to execute it is a, a bigger obstacle. So that strength comes from Balaram. Also, when we say Balaram, we can say the Guru, because Balaram is Adi Guru, original Guru. The Guru represents Balaram, so strength Strength comes from the Guru. Guru gives knowledge, but by his mercy also we get the strength to follow. Because what's the use of knowing something if we can't, if we don't have the strength to follow it? And, and it's actually quite painful to know something is in it and not follow it. it. It makes us feel very guilty or shameful. So I've often said it, it, in, in a sense Knowledge is, is edifying and blissful, but at the same time, it has this other side where it can make us feel despondent if we don't follow it, if, if we have information that we don't follow. And we suffer because we don't follow, then naturally we feel bad. So let's continue reading. Balaram is Nityananda. Prajendra nandana ye sachi sutta hoilo se balaram hoilo nitai. That means 
Rajendra, Nandana, Krishna came as Mahaprabhu, and Balaram, Sachi Sutta Hoyles, um, Balaram came as Nitai. Rajendra, Nandan became the son of Sachi, and Balaram is Nitai. This Bala, Balaram, comes with Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and both of them are so merciful that in this age of Kali, one may very easily take shelter of their lotus feet. They come especially to deliver the fallen souls of this age. Papitapi yata chilo harinam udalilo. That means uh, they come to give the holy name to papi, <laughs> sinful people. Their weapon is Sankirtan Harinam. Thus one should accept the sword of knowledge from Krishna and be strong with the mercy of Balaram. We are therefore worshipping Krishna Balaram in Vrindavan. In the Mandaka Upanishad, it is said, Nayam Atma Balahinena Labhyo Nachat Pramadat Tapasyo Vyapyalingat Etar Upayar Upayar Yatate yastu vidvam stasyaiva atma vishate brahma dhamma. So this first line, Prabhupada quotes a lot, Nayam atma bala hinena labhyo, without, without um, one can't make advancement without spiritual strength, or without here, it says bala. Um, without bala means strength, so we can say, um, as Prabhupada translates this, translates this. One cannot attain the goal of life without the mercy of Balaram. So, the topic of this, this talk was the demons within. And when we think about fighting ourselves, fighting our own demons, fighting our own, fighting our own resistance, fighting our own lack of willingness to surrender our lack of willingness to give up attachments that are in the way, that are anartha against our benefit, then we always understand that mercy is required because our own strength is insufficient. So, so this verse, Nayamatma Balahilena, Labyo, that one cannot make spiritual advancement without spiritual strength or without the mercy of Balaram. Um, yeah. Yeah. So when when we think about what it means to be Krishna conscious, and we look at ourselves and our qualifications, then solely from that point of view, it doesn't look like the prospect is worth endeavoring for because. It seems impossible. But when we came to Krishna consciousness, we didn't think that way. Even though we could have stood back and said, this is impossible. With my conditioning, I could never be Krishna conscious. But we didn't say that. Why? Because we got some mercy. And because we got mercy, we were advancing. And therefore we had confidence that even though we were fallen or contaminated or conditioned, if we stuck with the process, we would eventually be successful. And we had confidence that we could stick with the process. The doubts generally come later on when one slips, when one falls, when one realizes more clearly how fallen one is and one understands that the process is perhaps more difficult, more strenuous, than one first imagined, then one starts to doubt whether or not I can become Krishna conscious. But the process of Krishna consciousness is not something that we ever thought or ever should think that we can master. It's not the spiritual, it's a relationship with Krishna. So you don't master relationships, you surrender to relationships. So it's not that we enter the realm of bhakti as we might enter a material affair, like, I'm going to learn to do this, I'm going to apply myself, I'm going to be very focused, I'm going to be very determined, 
and therefore I'll be able to succeed in what I'm doing. That's how we would approach something material. But spiritual life is different, and specifically because this is a relationship with Krishna, you can't approach it in the mood that I'm going to control it or I'm just going to, I'm just going to do it. At the same time, we should have determination. But the point is that we, we don't feel that it's solely within our power to be able to, quote-unquote, conquer Krishna. And Krishna wants us to conquer him. That's actually what he wants. He wants us to conquer him with love. But just by external application, studying Shastra, applying the process, doing my seva, that's insufficient because, because one would think that if I just do those things, then I'll be successful. And you can't just be successful by doing those things because there has to be the proper attitude, the proper consciousness. And that proper consciousness Trinadapi Sunichena, we enter bhakti with, I can't do this. So you, you have this conflict. It, it's, it, it's a paradox in a sense. Because Prabhupada tells us and Shastra tells us that determination is essential. Enthusiasm is essential. Patience is essential. But so there's certain elements that we have to have. And it makes it sound like if I have those, I'll be successful. But that's not the complete story. I can't be successful just because I'm determined. Because I might think, through my determination, I will be able to control Krishna. And that's not true. And, and, or one may think, through my determination, I will be able to conquer the modes of nature, the influences of my conditioning. So in a sense it's true, but in another sense it's not true, because... Our advancement in Krishna consciousness is dependent on what comes to us. We can make every effort in the world, but it depends on the mercy because it has to be given to us. So, on one hand, we're executing the process and we should execute it with determination. We should execute it with force. We should execute it carefully. But on the other hand, that's not a guarantee that we'll be Krishna conscious. The guarantee uh, that we'll be Krishna conscious is within the mercy that we get. So we, like where, where could we even get our determination unless Krishna was empowering us to be determined, to be steady? Like, like can I just manifest my determination? Well, in a sense, the answer is yes. In a sense, the answer is no because it will ultimately depend on Krishna. So that's where Balaram comes into the picture as the Adi Guru. And every Guru is representing Balaram. So we, we don't think that we can be Krishna conscious without mercy, without the mercy of the Guru. We know that that's foundational to our advancement. At the same time, we know that the mercy of the Guru comes when we're determined. So we understand the equation in this way. Yes, it is my determination and it is my strictness in following Krishna consciousness that will cause me to become Krishna conscious. But it causes me to become Krishna conscious not because I'm doing that, but because I'm pleasing Guru and Krishna and I'm getting their mercy. And it's their mercy that's giving me the strength to go on. And so we have to remember that because Every day that we're in Krishna consciousness means that we've gotten mercy at least the day before and that morning that we got up and to execute our Krishna consciousness. That means that we've gotten, we've gotten mercy. There's sufficient mercy to keep us going. There's enough mercy that the material energy hasn't stopped us. Or in the context of what we're discussing in today's class, there's enough mercy that I... Um, have been able to at least to suppress or subdue the demoniac forces, the conditioning, the anarthas that I must battle with every day. I've been able to subdue it sufficiently so that I can go on and follow the principles and the practices of Krishna consciousness and do my service. And so that's 
a manifestation of the reality that I have Krishna's mercy. So we don't think that we're strong. We think that we are given strength by mercy. And so Balaram is our strength. So a lot of times the devotee may feel like I don't feel strong enough, I don't feel weak enough. So, excuse me, I feel too weak. And so in one sense, that's... um, (laughs) <laughs> in one sense, I need... In one sense, it's the right way to think, but in one sense, in another sense, it can be counterproductive. Because if I think I don't have the strength, and then I know where the strength come from, comes from, and then I pray to Guru and, and Krishna and to Balaram, I pray for strength then that's perfect. But if I think I don't have the strength and I think that strength depends on me, then I become distraught when I see my own weaknesses. So it's it's not really about my strength or not even about my weaknesses, but it's about tapping into the strength that will be given to me. And that's the whole... I mean, if you, if you study how Prabhupada, it is very interesting I mean, to, to look at how Prabhupada was planning to spread Krishna consciousness through his disciples. You, you'll find, at least as early as 1968, Prabhupada saying that I may not be here very long and I want you to be gurus. So, so how could, you know, 18, 1968, you had a lot of 18, 19, 20-year-olds who are brand new in Krishna consciousness, and Prabhupada is already telling them, you will become guru. And so how is that possible? They're, they're not stable, they're not even on the stage of Anartha and Navritti yet. And unless you're on the stage of Nista, you probably shouldn't try to be guru. So then Prabhupada further explained, he said, you may not be pure, but the instructions you're given are pure. And if you follow sincerely those pure instructions, then what you're doing is pure. And so the key element in Prabhupada's explaining this principle and what we saw in terms of people advancing was that you follow this, you follow sincerely. And then you follow sincerely, it's like you tap, you tap into the mercy, the energy source. And because you tap into it, now you have it. So now that you have it, it doesn't matter how fallen you are because now you have this mercy and this mercy is therefore empowering you. A lot of people were confused about this because they said, well, to be guru, you have to be Uttama Adhikari and and have so many realizations. And that's not what Prabhupada is saying. He's not describing pure devotee on that level. He's describing that if you're connected to the pure line of the pure instruction, by following it purely, by speaking it purely, then you have the Shakti. The Shakti is given to you, and then you can give it to someone else. And it doesn't matter that you're here, you're here, you're here. You're transmitting something pure. So in the same way, even if you're uh, not a guru, but still you're a preacher, you're transmitting something pure. And even if you're not a transmitter, and you're just following the practices, as I said, you can't follow without strength, so you're connected to the powerhouse through through the following. But it's not the following per se that's giving you the strength. It's because you're following, you're getting the mercy. Um, and so that means, in the, if you look at it from that perspective or in that context, then to think I can't achieve something doesn't make sense because the potential to achieve is there for all of us in spite of what we lack or in spite of our conditioning because it's like we're jumping on the train. Okay, I can't run very fast. If I jump on the train, then the train's going 300 kilometers an hour, at least the ones in China. So it's something like that. I have to just get myself to the train station, get a train ticket, and get on the right train. And once I do that, then I'm connected to the train, and the train takes me. So we're connecting to the disciplic succession. So then the power and mercy of Balaram comes, and then with that strength, the train is going, 
back to Krishna. So it's not my strength. My strength was to get on the train, but once I'm on the train, the train will do it. So, you know, if we say, I can't do it, or I can't do this service, or I'm weak, or whatever, that's okay. But don't allow that to stop you from following the process. Because no matter how weak you are, if you follow the process, then Krishna will bestow mercy. Or if you're teaching Krishna consciousness, you're trying to spread it, and you feel incompetent or incapable, then um, Krishna can empower you, or Krishna can send people to help you to make up for what you lack. So, so the idea that I'm doing it is where we get the doubt. Oh, I can't do this. All right, that's true, you can't do it. But you're not doing it. And once you understand you're not doing it and you tap into mercy, or you get the power of Balaram, then you start to think in, in a different way. You, think, oh, you start to think, well, anything's possible because I'm not doing it. And, and if I can conceive of it in my mind that I would like to do something for Krishna or I would like to attain a higher stage of Krishna consciousness, and I can pray for that, I can expect that. I just have to follow the practices, pray for the mercy, and wait for the mercy to come. In, in the early days of ISKCON, we had so much confidence that we could spread Krishna consciousness all, over the, all around the world. And then you might wonder, well, how could you have that confidence if you were such young devotees? Well, this was the reason, because we, we didn't think we were, going, we were going to do it. We thought, well, Prabhupada's doing it. If we assist Prabhupada, he'll do it, and it'll all happen. So in the same way Prabhupada's still doing it, if we assist him, then there's, there's no limit to what can happen. The limit is only the limitation in our mind of how we're thinking. But the problem is, we think the limitation is within us. No, I could never do that. And the, and the truth is, yeah, you could never do it. But it doesn't mean Krishna could do it, couldn't do it. Or I could never be that Krishna conscious. Okay, that's true, you couldn't. But it doesn't mean with the mercy of Guru and Krishna, you, you couldn't be that Krishna conscious. So when you frame everything in that way, then it opens up uh, a different paradigm of thinking of how, how much you could advance how much you could desire to advance, and what you could do in your service. So, that, that, is, um, that is how we can receive Balaram's mercy. And, you know, when you're, when you're humble, you're open to receive mercy. And humility, what does humility mean? Well, humility basically means I can't do it without mercy. Humility is the opposite of false pride. False pride is I do it because I'm smart or I'm talented. Humility is Krishna, you do it. Now, if you study many of the things that Prabhupada said about preaching Krishna consciousness, you'll see there's a theme there, and the theme is I'm not qualified but I thought, let me do it. So Prabhupada said, you know, so many of his god-brothers were sannyasis, they had so much association with Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. He didn't feel himself as qualified, but he saw nobody's doing this work of going to the West. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta wants it, he personally asked me, so whatever my disqualification is, I'll, I'll just make the effort because that's what he asked me to do. And so, many times when, when Prabhupada said, would talk about his success, and he would say, I don't have, uh, I don't have a qualification. It's, it's Guru, Maharaj's, Guru Maharaj's mercy. It's, 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 it's just that I did it. You know, Prabhupada was bold. Nobody was bold enough to come. And so Prabhupada, you know, when he was coming, he wasn't sure whether or not this could happen. And he knew if it's going to happen, it's not going to be because of him. It's going to be because of the mercy that he gets. At the same time, when we look at it from our perspective, we say, no, it is because of what Prabhupada did, because of his devotion. From Prabhupada's perspective, it's because of the mercy he got. So if we put the two together, we say, yes, because of his devotion, he got the mercy. And 
the reality is, if Krishna is going to use us, we have to be in a certain state of consciousness to be used. So obviously Prabhupada was in the perfect state to be used. And so all this mercy descended into Prabhupada. Um, a couple of times I, I've said something, but I don't know if all of you have heard this, and this is quite, uh, it's really quite amazing. When Prabhupada came to New York, we know what he was up against. It was, it was virtually an impossible situation. And just from an objective point of view, it was doubtful that Krishna consciousness could be successful. It's just, you know, we have, we have such a hard time making people devotees. And we have like 35 or 40 temples in America. And this is Prabhupada by himself. There's no organization. It's just Prabhupada by himself. And so he ha has to go to New York. He doesn't have to. He goes to New York. Well, he has to convince people to be Krishna conscious. Now, one of Prabhupada's god brothers said something that I find very edifying in context of the discussion we're having about Balaram and Itananda. And quite astonishing and amazing to meditate on and totally supportive of, of the discussion we're having. He said that Srila Prabhupada was Shaktavesh avatar. So when we say Shaktavesh avatar, we mean an incarnation of a potency. It doesn't mean all of a sudden he becomes God, but he becomes an incarnation of a potency. Like sometimes Prabhupada said to a, to a devotee, you're the incarnation of book distribution. He said that to Tripurari Maharaj. To a devotee named Jayatirtha, he said, you are the incarnation of management. So, so what did he mean? He meant you have a special potency, a special shakti, avesh, empowerment by Krishna to do this service. So Prabhupada's godbrother said something that I found amazing. He said that when somebody has no desire and just can be an instru instrument to be used by Krishna, then Krishna will put his potency within him. And therefore that person acts as Krishna would act. And this is what he said, which is quite amazing. He said that Srila Prabhupada was fully empowered by Nityananda Shakti because Nityananda Shakti is the Shakti that goes to the most fallen persons. If you look at the Leela of Lord Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya spent his time uh, in his preaching to, his preaching to scholars and Nitananda was the one who went to the Jagais and Madhais. So, so this god brother of Prabhupada, Sridhar Maharaj, said that in order for Prabhupada to do what he did to get those results, he had to be fully empowered by Nitananda. He had to embrace the Avesh, the Nitananda Shakti. And this, this was the, the next thing he said is amazing. So pay attention to this. This is incredible. And he said... There is no difference in what Prabhupada achieved in his preaching mission than if Lord Nitananda personally came and preached himself. What he did in New York City, uh, Sri Dharma said about Prabhupada, he said, what he did in New York City was no less than what Nitananda Prabhu could have achieved if he personally came. Because Nitananda Prabhu was empowering. He was fully present in Prabhupada's heart. Isn't that amazing? So what does that tell us? That tells us as a devotee becomes pure, the potency, Nityananda, Balaram, Guru, Guru's Kripa, Shakti, enters the heart of the devotee. It gives the devotee understanding. It gives the devotee realization. It gives the devotee power both in his own practice and it gives the devotee power in his work of spreading Krishna consciousness. So now, if you have that power, you embody a greater power than yourself, then you can do amazing things. And that's why whenever somebody said to Prabhupada, you've done amazing things, he always said, no, I'm not qualified to do this. I'm, I'm not this and I'm not that. And then he would say, if anything wonderful was done, it was done by the kripa of my guru. It was done by the mercy of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasana, not by my mercy. And, and so, if, if we analyze this, then it looks like this. Prabhupada 
surrendered soul, completely surrendered to the instruction of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, willing to give up his life because he didn't know how he would live in America. He actually thought there wasn't anything to eat here. And he had no money, he didn't know how he would get money. So he's putting his life on the line to spread Krishna consciousness. And of course we know Srila Prabhupada, his heart is completely pure. His only desire is to fulfill the order of his guru, but not artificially because he manifested that desire. So his only desire was to give Krishna consciousness, not, not just because his guru ordered it, but it was in his heart. Like sometimes our guru may order us do something, but it's not in our heart, but we do it because he wants us to do it. We, we may not want to help people, but he says help people. So I don't care if these people go to hell, but Guru Maharaj asked me to help them, so I helped them. Prabhupada obviously wasn't like that. His Guru Maharaj asked him to preach in the West, and Prabhupada was full of compassion. And that was manifest in many occasions. You, you, you could see Prabhupada's compassion. He actually cared. It wasn't just his Guru asked him to do this, and it was just being dutiful, but he actually cared. So he's fully manifest in compassion and dharma, the order of his guru, and fully making the effort. So what happened? Heart is clean, desire is pure, Nityananda Shakti comes. And now what happens when Nityananda Shakti comes, as Sridhar Maharaj said, he does what Nityananda would do. There's no difference. And therefore, these amazing things start happening. The impossible starts happening. And these people who are very young in Krishna consciousness and who have lived a very, very sinful life or sinful lives are now becoming leaders of a movement that is going to go worldwide and Prabhupada said eventually make history in saving this planet. Now, that's incredible. So, following this line of thought, Prabhupada is saying, I couldn't do this. It was mercy, it was the Shakti, Balaram, Guru Shakti, Balaram represents Guru Tattva, Balaram Shakti, through my Guru Maharaj, this is why we're successful. But it doesn't end there. Now think of this. So Prabhupada's having this experience that Krishna consciousness is spreading by mercy. And so what's his strategy? If, if by mercy this movement is spreading, that I'm just dancing to the tune of my guru, but I have no qualification, then if my disciples do the same thing, they can be equally successful. And then, so Prabhupada sends his disciples out, who externally are not qualified, but are sincere and willing to follow the principles, and Prabhupada is saying, Krishna will help you, and Krishna will empower you. So it's the same thing going on through th those disciples. And then those disciples having all kinds of successes, which are, you could say, inappropriate successes for the level of their advancement. Then you have this other example. Just, just to make this example more clear, you have Prabhupada's godbrothers in uh, maybe 1930 or 1928, whenever it was, they went to Europe, and these are sannyasis, highly qualified, cultured people, well-educated, intelligent, who would say, more advanced than we are, more intelligent than we are, more cultured than we are. But something doesn't happen when they go and preach. And they're being sent money also, whereas Prabhupada wasn't sending his young disciples money that were going out to start temples. So you have these highly qualified people, but they weren't able to, they did very little compared to what we were able to do. And then Prabhupada said that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasthati Thakur called them back because they weren't doing anything and he was sending money and he was kind of, I guess, disgusted is the word or um, maybe there's a lighter word. Um, they did something, but nothing that really warranted them staying there and him spending the money. So he was um, somewhat disheartened by it. They couldn't, they couldn't do much. And it kind of set a precedent that Nobody came after that because it seemed like you couldn't do anything. And, and you see that this order to come preach in the West, it was an open order, but nobody took it up. right? So now Prabhupada takes it up. He gives it to us, and lo and behold, we're able to spread Krishna consciousness, and we're completely unqualified. We Compared to those sannyasis and devotees from Gaudiya Mat that went 
said, we're nothing. We're just a bunch of malechas, outclassed, outcast, hippies, fallen. No Brahminical background. We don't know much. And pretty gross, basically, in terms of Vaishnava etiquette. We don't really have much. But what did we have? We had this desire to please Prabhupada. We had a willingness to, and the common sense to follow his instructions. And therefore, what did we have? Some of that Nitananda Shakti that Prabhupada has, it wore off on us. And we were able to do amazing things. Um, let me give you an example. Um, as, you, as some of you know the story that um, I've been a devotee eight months and maybe four, I had come to Christian consciousness four months before I began joining, but I wasn't chanting 16 rounds until I moved in the temple. I mean, some days I may have been. But not till the time that I was close to moving in the temple was I chanting 16 rounds. And um, I think only a few weeks before I moved in was I perfectly following the regs. I was following them, but sometimes slipping. And eight months after that, at the age of 20, I just turned 20, I was put in charge of a temple. So, that doesn't look like much of a qualification. And it seems, at least if we look at it in the context of today's ISKCON, you would never take a devotee who's 20 years old and eight months in the movement and let him become a temple president. What to speak of not training him how to be a temple president. Right? So, I felt very helpless because... Materially speaking, I was helpless, and also spiritually speaking, I was helpless. So, I used to pray, Prabhupada, Krishna, please, please help me. Please, please send devotees. Because I don't know what I'm doing. I really don't know what I'm doing. I don't, I'm so incapable. But I felt that I was sincere. At least I hope that I was sincere. I mean, I must have been sincere. I, I, I did the service. I stuck it out. It was difficult. We didn't have much. Sometimes we didn't have money to pay the rent. We didn't have heat at night in our building. It was in Canada. It was cold. Uh, we didn't have a vehicle. And we, didn't, we only had a few devotees. And so I stuck it out and I prayed and I stuck it out and I prayed. And I just stuck to the program that Prabhupada had given us, the morning program. And then every day, or at least six days a week, we went out in Harinam Sankirtan the whole day. From like 10 or 11 till 6. And that was the program. And so that's what we did, and we did our Sunday feast. And that's all I really did. That's all I really know how to do. To do. I didn't know much. You know, we preach a little bit, whatever we knew. And I was there, I think I was there a year and a half. Came in November of 70, and then 72 of March, I was transferred to Toronto. And when I left, the, the total number of people who had joined must have been somewhere between 15 to 18, and we had opened a second temple. And, and I would like to say that it all happened in spite of me, uh, not because I was strategizing and the plans were unfolding. No, it was, it was that I was trying. That's all I was doing. I was trying. And Krishna saw I was trying Krishna saw that I would take care of devotees and he said, okay, we'll make this happen. So we should never think, yes, I'm going to go make something happen. We should strategize. We should have plans, obviously. But we should always understand that there's another dimension to what we're doing. And Krishna, if he's pleased, then he'll send people. And Prabhupada said that. He said, if Krishna's pleased, he'll send people. If we can take care of them, he'll send people. If, if a Prabhupada, in another place in Bhagavatam, he said, if we cooperate together, if we work well together, then we'll get special mercy. So everything's happening by mercy. So if we just do the things that would give mercy, that would enable us to connect with this powerhouse, then it doesn't matter who we are, what we are, what our lacks are. That That's... That, that's it's just we shouldn't consider that. And this is the very reason 
that Krishna consciousness spread so quickly because you had a whole movement of devotees who weren't thinking, I'm not qualified. They were just thinking, this is what Prabhupada wants us to do. Let's just make our best efforts. And, and things, things were happening so quickly in those early days of ISKCON that it, it was like, it was like a, what do you call those? Like, like in the military, you know, those cannons that just, they can just drive through a forest and knock trees down to get where they're going. The spreading of Krishna consciousness was like that. It was just anything in the way. We just knocked it down. And we were very young and inexperienced. And so we, we lived within that realm of, of depending on mercy because we were well aware that we're really not qualified to do this job. And, and so it shows that our material qualifications are not the ultimate qualification. And Krishna can do anything through us if we're sincere and we're willing. And so this is the whole philosophy behind the Guru Tattva and Balaram's mercy. So today, today, as the appearance day of Balaram, is, is, is a special day for us to pray to him to get his mercy, to get his power. Because if we don't have his mercy, we don't have his power, then how can we advance in Krishna consciousness? How can we even maintain our Krishna consciousness? What to speak of advancing? So, But if we have his power then really, in a sense, there's no limit to what we can achieve because the only limit is the limit we place on ourselves. And we don't have to place any limit on ourselves because we're connected to Balaram. And so by his mercy, anything could happen. So if we're in that frame of reference or frame of consciousness, it changes the way we think about our own spiritual advancement and it changes the way we think about spreading Krishna consciousness because they were not limited to... We're not limited to the construct to the to our objectifying our own limitations. To a, I can't do this, I can't do that. But yeah, yeah. And Prabhupada said, I can't do this and I can't do that. But the I can't do this and I can't do that didn't limit his endeavor. You see what I'm saying? So you know, because if Prabhupada's thinking, I'm not qualified, and how will Krishna consciousness spread? I don't you know, in his poem on Jaladuti said, I don't see how this can happen. And at the same time, he's making the endeavor to do it. So he's not saying, I don't see how this can happen. I'm going to turn around and go back to India. When he says, I don't see how this can happen, really what he's saying is, I'm not qualified. And, and I, I don't have a vision to see objectively or materially how this is possible. But there's an order for my guru, and he wants me to do it. And, and he, he's empowering me. Um, he must empower me, otherwise, um, if he doesn't empower me, then um, how can I, it, I just, you know, this is impossible. So, so when he's saying, I can't do it, he's not becoming discouraged. All he's saying is, Krishna, if you want to do it, I'm willing to do it, you can use me, I'll dance, but you have to pull the strings. So, this is the distinction between a material, material way of thinking I can't do it and a spiritual way of thinking I can't do it. The spiritual way is humility. Okay, Krishna, I'm dependent on you. The material way is I can't do it and it's just depression and discouragement and I don't try to do it. A lot of times, I remember this distinctly as younger devotees, we would sometimes come up with an idea which was a bit outrageous and, and sort of impossible, at least it seemed impossible, within the context we were in, with the resources we had. But the idea inspired us. We, we liked to come up with ideas that were impossible because we, we felt it was exciting, it was fun to try to do something that we felt we couldn't do. But it didn't discourage us from doing it because we thought, well, if Krishna wants, then he could make it happen. So why not try it? It'll be fun to try. So when we first tried to distribute Krishna books, big, hard Krishna books. Nobody was distributing them. On Sankirtan, Sankirtan, we just distributed magazines. And we thought, well, why don't we try to distribute Krishna books? And everyone said, yeah, right. No one's going to take them. And I said, I know no one's going to take them. But don't you think it would be ecstatic just to show them the books? Because these books are amazing. And what if by chance somebody takes one? I mean, we don't know. So, everybody, so the devotees thought, 
yeah, okay, that sounds good. We'll take out Krishna books and we'll show them to people. And of course, no one's going to buy them. But because it's such an impossible thing, and we thought, it's impossible to sell a Krishna book to a non-devotee. They wouldn't be interested and they're very expensive. So because it was so impossible, we thought, well, let's do it. It's fun. It's like, let's shoot the rhinoceros. You know, that's, that's how we saw it. We didn't look at it in terms of our own lack of qualification. We just thought, we just thought this would be fun. You know, I, I, I'm going to, it's like, I'm going to ask, I'm going to write a letter to Donald Trump and tell him, shave up, move into Brahmacharya Ashram, and purify yourself, because you're an idiot. And Donald Trump's going to say, yeah, that's a good idea. I think I'll do that. Yeah, I'll just, you know, take a leave of absence from being president and I'll join the, you know, the temple in L.A. or Washington, D.C. and I'll get trained up and I'll be a better president. Yeah, that's going to happen, right? But you see Prabhupada wrote Mahatma Gandhi a letter and told him to get out of politics and preach Bhagavad Gita and Gandhi never replied. I don't even know if he read the letter, but that's how, you know, it's like, okay, why not? And when Prabhupada came to America, you know who he wanted to meet? He wanted to meet the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the wealthiest people, the movers and shakers. Did you know that? Those are the people he was going after. So we were, you know, we were following Prabhupada's mood because he was so bold. We're like, okay, you know, hey, you know, maybe one of you wants to write a letter to Donald Trump and tell him, tweet others as you would like to be tweeted. I read that yesterday. You should, t- Donald, you should tweet others as you would like to be tweeted. Donald, you should become a Hare Krishna. You should definitely become a Hare Krishna. And you'll be more successful at everything you do. Yeah. So we would think, sure, right, you know. But some devotee might think, why not? Or why not speak to one of his aides or get a Bhagavad You know, we just try to do something that is um, impossible and difficult. And um, we became excited about the idea. It wasn't like, no, that's, we didn't think, oh, that's impossible. We're never going to be able to do this. We thought, that would be fun. Let's try it. So we went out with Krishna books. And we all had books in our bags and we showed the books to everybody. And we, we knew that no one was going to take a book. But we thought we'd just show them the Krishna book. We'd show them the pictures to tell them this is God. You know, look what God looks like. Pretty interesting, right? Have you ever seen a picture of God? Well, here it is. So it was just preaching. And that day, two people bought Krishna books. And we, we realized that we could actually sell these books. And now, you know, devotees would go out and, and eventually sell 100 big books. One devotee sold 200 book, big books. Inconceivable. But... That was the fun. The fun was, it doesn't depend on me. If Krishna wants, he'll send somebody. And, and, and sometimes devotees would tell stories, you know, they'd have a book in their hand and someone would come up and say, what's that book? And the devotee would say, it's a Bhagavad Gita. Say, I've been looking for that Bhagavad Gita. You know? so, so you never know, you know, when you go out, you just never know. Um, so we had that mood because that was Prabhupada's mood. And it, it, wasn't, it wasn't that we were calculating whether we're successful or not. It was like, it was like we, we were just, okay, well, let's try for this. It didn't matter where we landed. It was that, like, why not try for this? If it doesn't depend on my own strength, then why not try for this? And, you know, if it's, it's here, that's, you know, normally I would shoot for here, so at least I hit here. So that was kind of the mood. Uh, Prabhupada said that mood, and as I said, he... Um, he, that's how he managed this kind, with that mood. Okay, you go here, you go here. You follow these principles. You be sincere. Krishna will help you. He'll give you intelligence. You'll be able to do things. So, practically speaking, we were doing things which were far greater than we were qualified to do. And as I said, even Prabhupada's own god brothers were not able to do that. To do that. So, you know, Prabhupada later, you know, in, in purports, he said, if you don't follow the guru, you don't get the guru's mercy. So despite your intelligence, despite your ability, so-called advancement, you'll basically become useless. And he later said that, that uh, one of the devotees that went to preach in the West, that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta sent, he became a, a very materialistic, he opened a, mat- a materialistic institution, and uh, Prabhupada felt that he, uh, he kind of became impotent because he had disconnected from that powerhouse. And then 
Shamasundar, Mawati, Gurudas, that, that group, Jamuna, they were connected to the power of Prabhupada's mercy. They went to London and then after the first Rath Yatra, there was a headline just like, like Krishna's take London by storm or something like that. You know. So, you know, Prabhupada, you know, he talked about that article you know, here, you know, his god brothers couldn't do much and here Krishna takes London by storm, you know, and it's just some householders connected with that mercy. So that's the idea. So I'm going to go back and look at your comments or questions or... Um, and uh, Kamaniya says, um, um, you want a transcript of the class? Anyone want to transcribe this class and send it to Kamaniya? You're welcome. <laughs> um, I must, this is Radhika says, I must confess this is, a in, this is inconceivable at the moment. It still seems to me that Despite the mercy, the material quality of determination must be there because apart from mercy, that is needed. Yeah. Um, no, it's true. But my point was the determination alone. You, you, you need the determination because Krishna has to see that you're willing and capable of using the mercy. So, and, and if you're not even determined enough to get the mercy, then you won't even qualify. But my point was, don't think that determination alone is sufficient. By your own determination, you will be successful, or by your own determination, you will conquer Maya, because you need Krishna's mercy. It's, you, it's, it's, it's not, the equation is not, I, it's not like this. My determination will push Maya back. No. My determination will allow me to connect with mercy and then the mercy will push Maya back. It's, it's this way. It's not this way. It's this way. So I can't fight Maya this way, but I have determination to serve Krishna. I get Krishna's mercy. The mercy descends and then it pushes Maya back. That's the idea. So it's not that your determination is not important. Your determination is very important. But your, your determination is generating the mercy. It's, it's the process of how the mercy is generated. And, you know, and Krishna, like Prabhupada said, the movement will spread whether you stay or not. So, so if you stay, you'll get the credit. So Krishna has to choose people to work through. And if you can overlook your defects and limitations and have the confidence that by mercy of Guru, by mercy of Balaram, by Prabhupada's mercy, so many things could happen if I'm just willing to be a puppet, which is basically what Prabhupada prayed. Then you go in in that attitude. Okay, my qualifications, everybody knows I'm disqualified. Everybody knows I'm not that smart. I'm not that this or that. But let's put that aside. We want to spread Krishna consciousness. I want to be Krishna conscious. And I know that, that mercy is much more powerful than my limitations. So let me go forward with the, with the faith that if I get mercy through following and also believing and praying that the mercy can come and that, that the mercy can work through me. Don't think it can't. So I have faith it can work through me and then I pray for that mercy I follow the practices of Krishna consciousness strictly, then that mercy can work, and then you'll see that. You'll become more Krishna conscious, and you'll do more service, and bigger service. I know so many devotees who get the mercy, get Prabhupada's instructions, but not able to follow through, and follow, though they are convinced there is nothing higher, and it's best for them. I would, You know, the thing is that... Let's look at it like a disease. And so there's certain things you have to do to cure the disease. There may be medicine, there may be diet, there may be exercise. And so let's say you don't do all of them, you do some of them. So you're feeling better, but you're not that strong. But someone who does all of them, they're strong. So a, a lot of times what's happening 
in regard to what you're saying, as devotees get mercy, but they're not following through. Um, they just there's something in the equation that may be missing. There's like a little hole for Maya to fall into. And then you'll see the devotees who are well situated in Krishna consciousness. Um, they're just getting more and more mercy. There's there's no holes. So I was reading yesterday something really interesting. I forget the context of the conversation, but within the context of the conversation, a devotee was saying, they were talking about happiness in Krishna consciousness, and the devotee was saying, but Prabhupada, not all the devotees are happy. And Prabhupada was saying, no, a devotee is happy. And he said, yeah, but, but some of the devotees aren't happy. And Prabhupada saying, no, a devotee is happy. If you're not happy, you're not a devotee. So, like, in other words, there's something wrong in their practice, that there's something missing, because if you're a devotee, you'll be happy. If you follow the process properly, you'll be happy. That's what it means. So, if there's, you know, major difficulty, major fall down, major hesitation or something, something is missing in the execution of the process. But if it's executed properly, with not only externally, physically, but with the right attitude, then, no matter how difficult it is, you'll always have the energy to continue. You'll never give up. give up. And we have so many examples of that, so many devotees. Almost 50 years ago they joined, and certainly there have been ups and downs, but they're, they just keep going. You know, because there's, they're following well enough that there's sufficient mercy that they continue. So, you know, I think, I think we could think that any lack is a lack of mercy, and that lack of mercy may be a result of a lack of, of following properly. And so we're not getting... I'll give you an example. There, once I had a discussion, I wrote maybe ten gurus, and I said, you know, a lot of devotees who take initiation eventually are not chanting 16 rounds for some, maybe for the rest of their life or, or temporarily. So if, if they can't chant 16 rounds, and then you know, we make some agreement, okay, chant 8 or 4 or 12 or whatever, try to work your way up. But if many devotees can't do it, and we want to initiate many devotees, why don't we just lower it? Because everybody could chant four. So why don't we say it, chant at least four? That way, when you make a vow, you can keep to it. But if we say chant 16, and many devotees don't, then they're not keeping their vows. So wouldn't it be better they keep their vows? So one devotee said something I really like. He said, I, will, I wouldn't want to deprive anyone of the mercy of 16 rounds. Because Prabhupada said 16 rounds and you go back to Godhead. So, in other words... We need a sufficient amount of mercy, and there is mercy in the things we do. So if we want to get that complete mercy, then do 16 rounds. Follow four regular principles, not three, two, or one, not four rounds, eight rounds, not reading Prabhupada's books once in a while, but read every day. You know, now there's certain things you do, and because you do them, the mercy is contained within those activities. In other words, you actually like squeeze the mercy out of Bhagavatam by reading it. You squeeze the mercy out of the Holy Name by chanting it. You squeeze the mercy out of the Sangha by getting it. You squeeze the mercy out of the deities by taking darshan. So the mercy is in all those things, but you have to act in a way to get it. So you don't create the mercy, but you're, you... I think the best example I can give is you squeeze the mercy out of it. Like There's mercy everywhere, but you have to squeeze it out by your actions. So, and if you do that well, then you won't have this problem where you'll, you'll hit roadblocks because the mercy will get you over it. So maybe we can call this lecture Squeezing the Mercy. Squeezing, squeezing the mercy out of Krishna consciousness because it's true. If you don't know how to squeeze it, then you're going you're gonna to have problems. Traka says, we do the endeavor in Krishna, the results. You're under the sh- shade, the Shakti of Prabhupada. That was live, yeah, Prabhupada Shakti is. Uh, yeah. Um, and that's the meaning of humility. You know, there's so many ways of looking at humility in the context of this discussion. Humility means that I, on my own, feel incapable of executing the instructions of my spiritual master. But my humility is my dependence on him. So I'm willing to make the effort in dependence on him to give me the mercy and the shakti 
to be successful in executing those instructions. And because I have that mentality, he helps me. And then because he helps me, I gain confidence in continuing that mentality because it works. And so therefore, I become more confident that I can achieve more than I thought I could achieve because now I realize that it's just the right attitude that's necessary, not, not the material qualification, even the spiritual qualification, but the right attitude, the sincerity, and the, and the willingness to be humble enough to know that I'm unqualified and that Krishna can empower me if he chooses. He can empower anybody, empower you, me, or anybody. Otherwise, as I said before, how could Prabhupada be talking about his disciples becoming gurus as early as 1968? And he had said, he said, you know, you're not ready yet, but this is, this is what we're going to be doing. This is, this is how the movement is going to continue. And, you know, it's, it's another fact that's very interesting. Think about this. Okay, it's 1977, November, Prabhupada's leaving. The oldest devotees in ISKCON, if they join in 1965, are 12 years in the movement. And I think, it, it might, I think they were maybe, you know, 35 years old or so. Those were the senior people. 12 years in ISKCON, 35, right? Years old. And, and none of us felt qualified to be guru. It was just inconceivable to us. And then, you know, you would think, why wouldn't Prabhupada pick some godbrother or nephew or a god-nephew and say, we need you to be guru because I, none of my disciples are qualified. He didn't do that. He said, he said so many times, you become guru. This is what I want. All my disciples to become guru. Um, don't become guru in my presence, but after you can... Uh, make disciples unlimitedly. You know, this is what he's telling us. So that just makes this point so clear. And now we have maybe a hundred gurus, right? And the movement's going on. So it's based on this same principle, not our personal qualification, but it's the mercy acting through us. And, you know, the people that, that don't think that there's anyone qualified to be guru, they don't really understand this principle. And they don't understand how Prabhupada defined pure devotional service. So the order is pure, you execute the pure order sincerely without any motive other than to fulfill the desire of guru. That's pure devotional service, that means you're a pure devotee. And so this is a movement of pure devotional service. So if we all do that, then we maintain pure devotional service. We give that same pure devotional service to others, even though we may not be pure, but we give the pure instruction. And so all of you could become much more advanced than I am, and you might say, well, I helped you by giving you the pure instruction. That may be, but there's no limitation on how advanced any of us can become. So I just tell you what Prabhupada told me. I try to live what Prabhupada taught and so that I can purely transmit it and, and you can take that, and who knows what you'll do with that. You might make millions of people Krishna conscious. And I was just, you know, you go online and you see Gorgopal, million hits, two million hits, and then you'll look at a lecture online of Prabhupada and it's got 3,000 hits. Or, or a, a, a higher one may have 35,000. And so Prabhupada's grand disciples are, are preaching in a sense, or becoming more popular than even Prabhupada in a sense. And that's what Prabhupada wanted. He said, you will all do, you can do more than I, by the, by the power of Guru Parampara, you can do more than I. Because Prabhupada, you know, he tried in a humble way to say that he did more than his Guru Maharaj, which he did, but he never felt that he was more than him. But by that mercy, he was able to do more. And Prabhupada's saying, my disciples, grand disciples, they can do more. So that's the idea. Um, so, so when, when you understand that idea, then you understand, well, I don't have to limit things by my own limitations. The only limitation that I would have would be a lack of sincerity or, or a lack of willingness to, to, to just accept the fact that my limitations are not limitations if I'm connected to the, the instructions of my guru and to the pure process. 
that anything can happen and I can advance to very high levels in due course of time and I can make many people Krishna conscious. That would be the only limitation. But if you don't have that limitation, then your level of purity, even though it may be less than someone else, at the same time it's equal because you're purely transmitting and you're purely following because you're following without motive. And therefore, you can give pure devotional service to others. You know, I told this story before. One of our God brothers was asked by Prabhupada to chant on initiates' beads. And these initiates are his God brothers and God sisters. So he felt awkward and he said, I don't feel qualified to do it. And Prabhupada said, the order is pure. So you follow the order, then your chanting will be pure. So Krishna Karshani says, I understand your point, the Guru's mercy may empower us. Um, and at the beginning of the movement, devotees were not capable, but still doing amazing things. I, I have little... Uh, I have little, little what? But does it mean that we should not improve our material qualification or our service? For example, we are temple presidents, so should we learn how to manage? Yes, you should, but you shouldn't think that that's your qualification to be successful, that just by learning how to manage, I'll be successful. Learning how to manage is secondary. That's, that's the practical. Yeah, we should be expert, and a devotee is expert, so that's the practical. But sometimes we've seen, even without the practical Devotees have been successful because Krishna would send the devotees help. They weren't good managers, but they were very pure, so Krishna would send good managers and help them. And so these managers would organize all their programs or organize their temples. So it could happen that way. And um, yes, we should endeavor. Um, that's, the, that's the point. We should endeavor our best, but we shouldn't think that our endeavor alone is what's going to make us successful. Because, because it's a spiritual movement, and Prabhupada has always said, the spiritual movement cannot succeed solely on material principles. So the material principles are like, like, like just the material aspects of the movement. Yes, temples should run well. It should be managed well materially. But if there's no spiritual substance, the temple's going to die, even if it's managed well. There'll be no life in it. And, and sometimes, if it's mismanaged, but people are very sincere devotees and very pure, then Krishna will get it managed somehow or other, he'll help them, he'll send them, he'll give them some intelligence, or he'll send people. Um, it's definitely a fact that sometimes unqualified people can really mess things up. And um, it's not, you know, being sincere is not a replacement for material qualification. But at the same time, sometimes we see that as a devotee endeavors in their service, they get more ability and intelligence because of their sincerity. Like with the artist, Prabhupada said, don't go to school to improve your art, just paint. So a lot of times Prabhupada would say that, you know, just, just keep doing it, Krishna will give you intelligence. So that's a, more of a spiritual principle. And um, of course, on a practical level, we need people who are qualified, if they're teachers, they're managers, and so forth. And so, so it's a balance. It's a balance. But I think the easiest point to understand is that we never want to think that just by becoming materially proficient we'll be successful. We might be successful materially, but the life of ISKCON may die in the process. Could the, uh, Radha Priya says, could the determination give mercy? Yes. And through the mercy obtain qualities that a disciple never had? Yes. At the same time, we all have a nature, and we all have certain limitations and abilities. So I would say, let's say, Radha Priya, you're not a good musician. By your sincerity and your dedication, you may lead amazing kirtans where everyone's dancing. But from an objective point of view, it still may be that you're not a good musician. But your bhakti, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> your bhakti just overwhelmed everyone. So it was ecstatic. And sometimes you'll see a temple like that. A temple president is not really a good manager. But everybody loves him 
and he's such a good devotee that people are so inspired that everything in the temple goes on. In spite of the fact that he's not a good manager. So it can happen like that. But there are situations we have to be more careful. For example, let's say you're a teacher, you're in charge of kids. Uh, you need, obviously, sp specific skills when you're in charge of people, when people depend on you. You're a doctor. It's not like you're going to chant your way into being a doctor. So, obviously, there's a certain fundamental level of qualification for certain services. Anurag, uh, we're not that much compatibility even to what is telling to us, or even we don't want to do so. How can we remain determined and stand on our part? I'm not capability. Oh, make capability. But if we don't have the capability, um, when you when you find yourself like below the threshold of where you need to be, then there's a couple of things you can do. One is prayer. One is introspection. Just ask yourself, which is really asking Krishna, what do I need to do to get there? And um, look at you start to look at where your life's going if you keep acting the way you do and how your life would be different if you acted differently. And, and a lot of times it's very powerful to just look at the future a little bit and um, see where you're, you're going, where this is going to take you five, ten years in the future if you continue to do things exactly as you're doing. And that can motivate you to change when you see that what you're doing is not it's not going to take you where you want to be. And then you also have to be real, realistic about your capability. Maybe I can't be on this level now. Maybe that's 20 years ahead of me. And sometimes if I just come down to here and say this is realistic for me, then I can be very inspired on this level. But if I think I need to be on this level, I'll always be discouraged. So sometimes it's a readjustment. It's like, okay, I have to be happy on this level because as hard as I try, I can't seem to get beyond this level now. It doesn't mean you don't have your sights on this level. It just means an acceptance that this is where I am. And so by accepting that, it, it's a much more positive, it has a more positive influence on you. So, you know, and also you might think you need certain capabilities that you don't need. Maybe you have capabilities in one area and you don't in another and those others aren't necessary. You engage in services according to your capabilities. Um, don't lament for lack of capability. Just realize that that is not an area where you'll be proficient, but you have capabilities in other areas. So sometimes we psych ourselves out by not just accepting what our capabilities are and aren't and not adjusting to the level of capability. So I'll, I'll serve on this level. I, I may not save the world tomorrow, but I can do some service with, with the ability I have. Then internally, in terms of my spiritual advancement, uh, sincerity is, is really fundamental. That's the most. Start with that. Why am I a devotee? Why am I doing anything? Because I want to please Guru and Krishna. That's the most important thing. So start with that. And that will give you a lot of strength. Because if you want to please Guru and Krishna, then um, it's going to be impetus to follow their instructions. So, Radha Priya says, Could the determination to give mercy through the mercy... Yeah, we answered that. Mm -hmm. Efforts give us mercy. In other words, we use that example, squeezing. We have to squeeze the mercy out. How do you squeeze the mercy out of the holy name? Not by namaparad. Shrutanam, pure chanting. The mercy is there in the holy name, you squeeze it out. There's so much mercy in the Bhagavatam, you read it and fall asleep, or you don't read it. So we have to be able to squeeze the mercy out, and how do we squeeze the mercy out? It's through our effort, it's our endeavor. But the mercy is a gift. And so it's not our effort of chanting nicely that's causing us to be a Krishna conscious. It's the mercy of the holy name or the mercy of the Bhagavatam or the mercy of the Sangha or the deity. It's the mercy they're giving us. But it's our effort that they see, oh, by his effort he, he's showing me he wants mercy, so I give him mercy. So that's, that's you could say, the mathematical calculation. Well, the disciples have all the qualities, and for the mercy, these are shown. Um, you could say potentially we all have all good qualities, but it's covered, and so the mercy will uncover it. Um, and we'll reflect 
the qualities of our spiritual master and the devotees we associate with. Everything, yeah, everything will come as you become purified. That's the wonderful thing about Krishna consciousness. Whatever you want is waiting for you. It's just, it's just a level or two or three or four away. In other words, whatever level you're on, if you get to the next level, there's more things waiting for you. And you get, you know, when you get to Baba, like everything you want is waiting for you in Baba and Prema. So you know, we're looking at these stories of these great devotees, and they're exhibiting these amazing qualities, and they're engaged in service with with such surrender and faith we could never imagine having. Yet, that's all available to us on that level. As we go from level to level, those things just happen. So, you make your effort, Krishna gives you mercy, He kicks you up, and as you go from level to level, it's like, you know, it's a department store. There's a whole set of new items on the next floor. So, so many things that we want are just the next level above us, and we, we can't just get them, but, but through our efforts, we get Krishna's mercy to take us to the next level on that level. So many qualities, characteristics, and strength exhibit. You mentioned sometimes what happens later on in practice is that we get discouraged by our own limitations and our fall downs. So what is needed to remain encouraged despite that? Is it uh, just a material quality, an aspect of mentality? It could be. A material mental- it could be a deficient material mentality or it could be a deficient spiritual mentality. And, um, but I've given this example often that if you want something, like, like take a kid and a kid wants something, and there's so many things that are in the way of him getting it, like you, the parent, saying, no, you're not going to get it. He goes, yes. No, you're not going to. Yes, I want it. Give it to me. No, you're not going to have it. Because he wants it, he doesn't give up, even though it doesn't seem like there's any way he can get it, but he's determined to get it because he wants it. If you're hungry, You'll eat somehow or other. You have no money, no food, you're not home. You'll figure out how to do it. You'll borrow the money. You'll steal something. You'll call up somebody. Isn't it? You won't think, well, I don't have any money. I'm hungry, so I guess I'm just not eating today. You figure something out. So the point is, you may have so many problems materially that seem to prevent you from being Krishna conscious. But... But if you want to be Krishna conscious, you would never allow those problems to stop you. So that's one way of looking at it. Um, a more spiritual mentality would be that um, it doesn't matter how disqualified I am. By Krishna's mercy, the mercy of the holy name, anything's possible. And so I don't even think my disqualifications are disqualifications because from the spiritual point of view, they're not disqualifications. It's just they're just anarthas, and you know dis, disqualifications when I lack I lack sincerity or when I offend a Vaishnava, then I'm in trouble. But my own material conditioning, you just have to understand it's not really a problem. It's only a problem if you think it's a problem, because Krishna consciousness is so much more powerful than your conditioning. So the only reason it's going to stop you is just you allow it to discourage you. Oh, I'm so bad. I'm so this or that. Yeah, are you so bad that you can't chant Hare Krishna? Of course not. Right? You know, in fact, the uh, another mentality which would be better is by looking at how bad you are, you think, oh, I need to chant more purely. I need to be more Krishna conscious because I'm so bad. So, you know, if it discourages us, it's just a material way we're, th- we're putting everything. We allow ourselves to get discouraged. Because the same, another devotee may have the same conditioning you have, but be very determined because he's thinking, I'm so conditioned, I need Krishna consciousness, I have to be determined. So, you know, a lot of this is, is really not a spiritual problem, it's just a conditioning of how we face difficulty and how, we, how easily we give up. But I can tell you personally how I deal with my problems, internal lacking, that's how I deal with it. I, I see it and I think, I need the holy name. I need to hear and chant more. I need to do whatever, you know, more austerity. I need to do whatever I need to do to purify myself. I, I just take it as like a red flag. Oh, you need work, you know? 
you're exercising and you only do 10 push-ups. Do you get discouraged and think, oh, I, I can only do 10 push-ups. That's a sign I need to work harder, right? Because I want to be able to do 50 push-ups. So now I can only do 10. That means I'm really weak. So I go, I'm going to do 10 five times a day, every day until at one point I can do 50 in a row. The other way of thinking, which you're presenting, is I can only do 10, so why, why do anything? It's useless. Yeah, Krishna consciousness is more powerful than your anarthas. And so that's, that's why I never give up, because, because I, I know that, that Krishna consciousness can help me overcome whatever that weakness is, and I know if I give it up, then nothing's going to help me overcome it. <clears throat> uh, so Krishna Karshan, he says, sincere devotees mess up many things. Yeah, that's, I mean, on the material level, yeah, that's possible. It's also, a man, it's also a management problem that they gave people responsibilities who weren't capable. And they were sincerely trying, but um, it, they shouldn't have been in that position. Yeah, that's there. Um, but it was glorious that they were sincerely trying. Is it true that if you want to know the Guru, you should see the disciples? Not sure what you mean, but um, do you know something about the Guru by looking at his disciples? Hmm? Krishna God is more powerful than your conditioning. That could be a t-shirt. Okay. Next t-shirt, Priya. Krishna consciousness is much more powerful. So much more. It's much more powerful than your conditioning. Okay. So I have to go now because... Uh, they're going to do Abhishek at the temple. And about, if I leave now, I'll get there just in time. So, thank you all. And um, why don't we continue this discussion tomorrow at the same time? We can talk a little more about Balaram. Um, so, Guru Nishta, you can put up an advertisement that, um, same, that we'll have the same discussion. Um, how Balaram, how Balaram, Lord Balaram, helps us deal with our internal demons, and then we'll, we'll focus a little more on our internal demons. How does that sound? Okay? Balaram is amazing. He can empower all of you to do amazing things. Don't ever doubt this. You can doubt yourself, but don't doubt him. And don't ever doubt that he wouldn't empower you. That's, that is a fatal error. You think, well, I'm to this or that, that he would empower me. No, that's not true. We can all become qualified to be empowered by our sincerity and by our willingness to follow, and then he'll use us. And so if we think that way, we'll, we'll make more advancement and we'll do more service. Hare Krishna. Jai. We'll see you tomorrow, same time, same station. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Goranga. Balaram rules, yes, he definitely does. <laughs>